Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Sharon Collins. I'm professor and director of the Environmental Studies Program here at CU Boulder. And I'd like to welcome you to this town hall event. It's my privilege to be one of your moderators today. I'd like to welcome all the members of the campus community as well as the Boulder community and our CU system colleagues who are following us via streaming. As you all know, the chancellor annually gives a state of the campus address in the fall and then an update in the spring. But today we're trying something a little different with this panel of university leadership and our goal is to promote dialogue on some of the key issues facing the campus today. So we'll start by introducing the panel. First we have Kelly Fox, Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer at CU Boulder. <laughs> Russ Moore, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. And our Chancellor, Phil DiStefano. <laughs> Phil, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased that, um, at the number of individuals that uh, showed up today uh, live and also uh, in your offices uh, watching this through uh, our streaming video. Uh, I want to make a, a couple of uh, recognitions here. First of all, uh, my wife, Yvonne, uh, who's sitting with us here. <laughs> And two members of our Board of Regents, uh, Linda Shoemaker, representing Congressional uh, Two, right? Uh, <laughs> second, second Congressional District, and Steve Bosley, uh, rep, uh, at large representative to the Board of Regents. <laughs> Thank you both, both for being here. We really appreciate it. Now I'd like to introduce my fellow moderator, Judon Kabeda to introduce himself and tell, us, tell you how our program will run today. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, you can call me Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Judon. I'm a senior majoring in communications. I am also the president of student affairs for CU Student Government. So I'll talk about how today will work. So we have some questions uh, that our panelists will answer, and then we will move on to some emailed questions that we received from uh, CU at large, which made up of students, faculty, and staff. And then we will go to the audience if you all have any questions. So I'll get us started. And uh, the first question is for you, Phil. You can call me Chancellor. <laughs> 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 Just kidding, Phil's <laughs> fine. Well, I think you've actually earned that because you've been here for, what, over 40 years? 41 years, yes. I mean, are you bored or...? <laughs> I can't find another job, you know? I'm, just, uh, I'm, I'm stuck. Uh, no, what I want to say about that is uh, this university has been wonderful to, uh, to uh, me and to my family, uh, and it's been a pleasure to be at this university for 41 years, and uh, who knows, I might stick around for another few years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, more on a serious note. So a lot okay. of the meetings that I go to, uh, we're always talking about student success. And so I'm wondering what that means to you and how does that look on our campus? Sure. Uh, you know, student success is uh, actually a top priority for me. And one way of measuring student success is our graduation rates. And uh, a year ago, uh, we decided, uh, the provost and I and the deans, that we wanted to increase our graduation rate uh, from 70% to 80%. Uh, right now, 70% is the highest in the state, but I really feel for the type of student that we uh, admit to Boulder, that we can do much better, and that with the class that came in this past fall, uh, six years from now, uh, we hope to see that graduation rate uh, at 80%. And what I've said is, you know, one thing worse than a student leaving with a degree and debt is a student leaving without a degree and debt. And I want to make sure that our students leave with a degree and hopefully with low debt. Phil, in conversations that I have with faculty, they often wonder, how did you come up with 80%? Well, when you look at, at our AAU peers, and again, in the state, we have the highest graduation rate. But you know, when you look at our public peers like uh, the University of Washington, uh, UCLA, uh, UC Berkeley, their graduation rates are 80% and above. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, we're competitive. We want to be competitive with our AAU peers, and we want to get to where they are. Great, thank you. And so Russ, with your leadership, what is your department doing in order to reach this goal? Oh, so we've undertaken a lot of reforms. Um, I think some exciting reforms we've, we've invested in uh, would be uh, uh, advising, student advising in all schools and colleges. We made a significant investment in a common advising platform so that uh, all of our advisors will ultimately in the next year or two have a common uh, point of reference. So no matter what student they engage, they'll have access to student records. Um, We've had an advising uh, task force that provided recommendations on advising best practices. Had some very exciting programs that were piloted and that, and that are no longer pilots. One program is uh, drop-in advising at Norland Library, Monday through Thursday, 5 to 8 p.m. We also have uh, <coughs> advising available to students uh, during the day, during the week at Norland Library. Uh, and we found that to be quite popular. Uh, in arts and sciences, uh, Dean Lee has uh, overseen some of some really exciting changes under the direction of Shelley Bacon and how they conduct advising. So that's one of the uh, efforts we're undertaking. Another one would be, um, for example, um, starting to implement a new student orientation process. So we're t taking a multifaceted approach. We're taking pages from best practices from different universities, and we're trying to implement them in a coordinated fashion across the campus. You know, Russ, one of the things I've heard you talk a lot about also is the faculty mentorship program and how effective that has really been towards this end as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a remarkable program. So the BFA two years ago piloted a faculty mentorship program. So I think last year we had over 150 faculty volunteers who engaged over 1,000 uh, incoming freshman students. We each adop I, I was part of the program. We each adopted 10 students, met with them weekly. Uh, sometimes we discussed topics of interest. Other times we just met and chatted. And the whole idea there is to create a bond with uh, a responsible adult. The key is responsible. Um, <laughs> but that's been shown, actually, to create, a, to create a bond with a responsible adult during your freshman year is one of the strongest uh, predictors of student success. So uh, we're going to continue to invest in that program uh, moving forward. And uh, we're, we're very excited about that. And I really want to compliment all the faculty and staff who participated in that. It's, it's very exciting. Russ, you mentioned changes in orientation. Can you talk a little bit more about what changes you have in mind? Yes. So um, we've heard feedback from students and uh, parents that um, orientation can sometimes feel over overwhelming. So the idea is typically the typical orientation paradigm is uh, students and parents will show up on campus for a couple days and they'll get a, just a huge amount of information uh, put, up, put, put upon them. Uh, so what we're trying to do is take a different approach. So from the time a student is accepted, we'll start to engage that student. We'll have a clearly delineated pathway. In fact, the, the uh, uh, orientation task force, I just received an email from them today, very clearly articulated and delineated plan for staying engaged with students from the day they're accepted, uh, essentially all the way through to where they graduate. But the important piece is, is uh, we're uh, communicating with students in ways that students like to communicate. It's not like old people communicate. Uh, it's technology, it's social don't media. Don't point at me. I mean, don't point at all of us. No, I'm kind of doing one of those. Point at me. Yeah. No, so, so, and then we'll have a, 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 a more uh, reliable cadence of communication, small snippets of information that students can revisit. So, for example, we have an uh, orientation website that you can go to that was just put together. And we'll be communicating with, we're already communicating with students. Uh, and we're changing the, the terminology from orientation to welcoming. Uh, as one of our colleagues said, you can welcome a student more than once, and orientation is kind of a one-shot deal. So uh, basically, we're taking a, a more technology-assisted approach. There'll be a very high-touch approach as well, where students, even before they show up on campus, can call and engage with an, uh, with an advisor. And we're trying to make the process as seamless as possible and make it easier for students to enroll in classes and to just become part of the fabric of the campus. I think Sounds very 2015. That's yeah. great. Yeah. I think there's also uh, an important role that everyone here can play when we have um, new student welcome days on campus. So everyone engaging with the students as they come will help ensure the success of um, this new program that you're describing. Right. So I know something else we've been hearing a lot um, has been that recruiting students has become a lot more competitive across the country. And now that Colorado has actually become a focal point for colleges to recruit students. 
Uh, Kelly, I was wondering if uh, you had any insight on why Colorado and how is this affecting our university? Sure, yeah, this is actually a, a national phenomenon. The, the rest of the country is uh, starting to understand you know, non-resident students and non-resident student recruitment. And Colorado happens to be one of five states in the nation that over the next several years are going to see increasing numbers of high school graduates. And as a result, what we're seeing is a, an ever-increasing pressure to, um, to become more competitive with our uh, resident students. The, um, I, I think some of the programs we put in place just recently, like the Esteemed Scholars Program and others, help ensure that we're showing the value and um, how important these students are to us. But today, there are more than 37 out-of-state recruiters living here permanently, whereas five years ago there were less than five. So this is a, it's an important issue for us to pay attention to. So we talk a lot about the social climate on campus, and Phil, I'm wondering how important you think social climate is to student success, and what can we do as a campus and as faculty and staff and students to improve campus culture and climate? Sure. I mean, when you think about it, um, climate and culture on this campus uh, those are the responsibilities of all of us, uh, every single one of us, every faculty member, every staff member, every student, really has to have the climate issue, the culture issue uh, at the top of your list. And uh, when, when, I, when I think back to uh, what our students did a few years ago, the Colorado Creed, uh, our students developed that creed, uh, and they did this on their own, and they talked about issues such as respect <coughs> and integrity and responsibility, and you see that as you walk through, throughout the campus. But I don't think we've really engaged that creed uh, as a faculty or as a staff. And, and I want to do that. I want to start there and say, let's take the Colorado Creed, which our students developed, created uh, a few years back, and let's embrace it, all of us, and, you know, and think of those terms. I actually, uh, if I may, I, I brought along the, the creed, and. I don't have it memorized, but it's, it's basically when students come here, they agree to act with honor, integrity, and accountability in their interactions with students, faculty, and staff, and neighbors, uh, respect the rights of others, and accept our differences, and contribute to the greater good of this community. And I think we should all live by the Colorado Creed, uh, not just our students. And I want to thank our students for developing this creed. Again, they came up with it on their own. Uh, but I think it's time now for all of us to embrace that creed uh, and to live that every day as we uh, walk around campus, we teach our classes, and we do our work. Yeah, I think one interesting thing there is this works beautifully with our new orientation process. I think we can be begin to inculcate the Colorado Creed from day one with all of our students. And it's not something you just give to students or faculty or staff just one time. I think, there, again, there needs to be a regular cadence of uh, using the Colorado Creed as a touchstone for all of us, particularly our incoming students. And I think in that way, we can really positively influence the culture on campus through this new orientation process. You know, and honestly, I think a lot of faculty aren't aware of, of all that goes in, that all that went into the Colorado Creed. So I think that's something that could be um, in, uh, in introduced in faculty orientation, for example, new faculty or orientation. Yeah, interesting. There are elements of the creed all over campus, and sometimes you wonder why is integrity here and, yeah. and respect, and it derives from the mm -hmm. students who cr created, I think, a really wonderful document. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And so touching on campus climate, Russ, I had a question. So how does the university, how does administration define diversity, and why is diversity such, such a, why is, why is diversity an important a priority to, to this campus? Well, our, our definition of diversity is very broad. It, it's no one thing, it's, it's all things. So we, we really want to promote diversity. We want to reflect uh, the state of Colorado and, and basically our region. Um, it, I think it's really important for us to move forward as a productive society and to work in a productive democracy, to, to really have all voices and opinions uh, represented at the table. Uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of, and I don't take much credit for it, I think it's to the credit of the staff and, and, and the faculty here, uh, for a number of years, every year, every incoming freshman class has been the most academically prepared and most diverse class, and, and that looks like we're headed for another record uh, fall. 
Uh, and Knock um, on yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you told me that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but I think I think we're making great progress in that area, and uh, uh, we have plenty of headroom to, to make that work. But um, I, I think we're moving in the right direction, and we'll continue to recommit to it. And if I may add, you know, diversity enhances the education of all of our students. So the more diverse we are as a student body uh, and as a faculty and a staff, that's going to enhance education for everyone. Uh, and our efforts uh, not only to recruit underrepresented students from the United States, but also the, what we're doing with international students as far as recruiting uh, a record number of international students this year, uh, that too will increase the, the education experience for all of our students. And again, that's all part of student success. And, and we just have to keep working on it uh, along with the culture and climate. But I think that's something that all of us, again, uh, when we think about it, it's all of us participating, all faculty, staff, and students. And so beyond, beyond recruiting, what, are we, what is campus doing to retain these students? So what I think what, what we're doing, all of, the, all of the investments we're making in advising, orientation, all of those uh, programs are intended to promote the student success, retention, increased graduation rates for all of our students. Uh, it's, there's national data to show that when we embrace those best practices, there's a, uh, an inordinately positive effect on underrepresented students and students who don't uh, historically uh, graduate at as high rates. So we're taking that approach. Uh, I, th I think a really important part, though, is to really focus on promoting a, a more welcoming campus culture. Uh, as you'll recall, CUSG, BFA, and my office, the provost's office, sponsored uh, four town hall meetings or um, get-together meetings to discuss campus culture. And it was a dialogue between faculty, students, and staff on what are the issues at hand. Um, sometimes we touched on topics that weren't that pleasant to touch on. But um, as you well know, I think we made positive first steps. And we intend to, with the partnership of CUSG and BFA, have these uh, uh, town hall meetings on an annual basis, and not, maybe not only just during the fall semester like we did last year, but to have these regularly scheduled so that we can have an open campus dialogue. I think if we can bring everyone together to talk about issues of substance, again, sometimes not that fun to talk about, I think that's the only way we can make progress moving forward. And I'm actually very pleased with the participation of students and faculty in this process. Thank you. Phil, this question's for you. Uh, there's been a lot of news and a lot of conversation about Title IX enforcement and sexual harassment cases, both about how victims have been treated and also a potential backlash against the perpetrators. And there have been some accusations that CU Boulder's had to respond to on both sides of that issue. How are you directing the campus to handle these issues, and how much of a priority is it for you? Well, Sharon, that's, obviously it's a very <coughs> high priority, top priority. I mean, the safety of our students uh, is crucial, again, to student success. Uh, you know, Russ, you, two of your children went to, you know, college away from Colorado. Uh, our three children uh, went to college here in Colorado, and yours are too young uh, <laughs> to go, and Sharon's well, and, uh, are too young to go to college <laughs> at this point. But, you know, as parents, you know, I think sometimes, you know, we have to look at ourselves, you know, besides the chancellor and the provost and the CFO, we're parents. And, uh, our major concern when we sent our um, daughters and sons off to college was their safety. And I want to make sure that, that this is a safe campus uh, for all of our students and also for our staff and faculty. And I want to become a leader, uh, and I think we are becoming a leader. Uh, last year I w was able to hire uh, Valerie Simons as uh, our Director of um, Institutional uh, Equity and Compliance and also our Title IX Director. And Valerie has had uh, enormous experience as a civil rights attorney uh, and has worked in this area for such a long time. And one of the things that, that Valerie has done in a very short time is she merged our, our two units together of student conduct and our, our Office of uh, Discrimination and Harassment. And I think that's helped tremendously to bring those two together. We also use, uh, here at the University of Colorado, uh, the kind of investigative model. Uh, to look at cases of, of harassment and discrimination. And not all universities use a, uh, an investigative model. And it's one where I think we're being very fair to the complainant and to the respondent. Uh, and we're also offering services to them. 
uh, as they need them. So again, I, it's a high priority. I want to be a leader. I think we still have much more work to do. Uh, we're not there yet, um, but I have uh, confidence in Valerie and some of the members of her team um, who are with us today to really make sure that uh, this is a safe campus for all students. One of the things I, I really appreciated was that you also identified that training was an important part of that almost initially when Valerie got here and immediately allocated resources to invest in training around these issues. The training and education are just are key uh, to the success of this program. I think the other is having Valerie report directly to me sends a message to the campus community that this is a top priority. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that that happened. So when we hired Valerie, um, we wanted to make sure that she reported directly to me that she had the resources uh, to do what she needed to do, again, to become a national leader uh, in this area. And so what about uh, discrimination issues? Well, definitely. I mean, we, there are discrimination issues here uh, everywhere across the country. Uh, and we, we have to figure out ways of, of uh, remedying the problems. Uh, when, we, when we look at the uh, different, as I talk to students and, uh, around the campus and you know, hear about some of the problems that they're having uh, in their classrooms, uh, in the residence halls, uh, in the community, dealing with uh, issues of discrimination. Uh, and again, it's, it comes back to education and training. And we need, again, to continue to do uh, a better job of educating the campus community uh, on these issues of discrimination uh, and harassment. So um, <clears throat> moving a little bit to the research enterprise of the campus, um, many of us have heard about or been involved in the Grand Challenge that's being initiated sure. on campus. So Phil, I wonder if you can tell us what this is and how it got started. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, when you think about the role of a, a research university like ours, a uh, comprehensive graduate research university, um, one role that we have, uh, and that is uh, to do research that will solve complex problems uh, in our society. And I want to take a look at how do we involve all of the faculty, uh, not just segments of the faculty, but all of the faculty in a challenge that will really look at solving some critical issues uh, in our society. And it's based upon uh, the work that the faculty has already done. I mean, in the area of uh, aerospace sciences and engineering, uh, where we're the top NASA-funded uh, university, uh, and also in the area of geosciences, where we're number, number two in the world. And how can we uh, really start with those strengths, but involve many more of the faculty? So starting from an area of strength or areas of strength. And so the grand challenge brings together faculty from the sciences, from engineering, but also uh, from our humanities, from our social sciences, from our policy makers, to take a look at what I think is an important issue, and that is you know, how space-related technologies uh, impact our everyday lives. I mean, if you think about it uh, with you know, emails, you know, we're GPSs, um, we look at um, weather, uh, we look at the different satellites, unmanned aerial. I mean, we start thinking of what's up there in space and how that has an impact on our lives. We need to study that. We need to know what's going on and to study that. I mean, think about a day without space-related technologies. You know, how would our lives be different? Yeah, well, I think maybe we should think about a, a day without 11 p.m. emails. See, you know, so we could, we could, you know, Imagine a world. You know, <laughs> shut down, shut down that, you know, those satellites at 11 p.m. to 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. <laughs> so we can idea. sleep, you know. Um, but if I think about it, you know, as, as the, the technology that we use uh, every day. I mean, if we wanted, you know, to drive to Denver, we look at, you know, where, where's the construction? We know 36 is, but we can go onto our GPS and find quicker routes to here or there. Uh, and that's all done by, by satellites. And how do we understand that? And how do we really take a look at that from a social issue, from a scientific issue, from a human issue? Um, there's also the issue of privacy. Uh, and how does space-related technologies impact our privacy? And so what I'd like to do, and, and I've asked Russ and, and the deans and the faculty to really come together and to think about how we look at space-related technologies 
and how we study it and how we use our great research capabilities that we have at this university to solve some of the problems today and in the future. So Russ, if I'm a faculty member that hasn't been reading my email <laughs> and don't know about the grand challenge, is it too late for me to get involved? No, not at all, not at all. So um, this, this whole process started and it'll be defined by the faculty and well, it'll actually be defined by the faculty and students. I have my opinions on it and I'll share some with you in a moment. But where we've been is we had a town hall meeting or a grand challenge meeting where we convened over 200 faculty and staff to get together to come up with ideas on brainstorming on what could the grand challenge be. And again, um, we are the number one university in space sciences. I think arguably we are number one and number two is probably a fair ways behind us. But this isn't just about space sciences and this isn't just about engineering. So we convene people to get together and I'll get, get I'll give you a little update. So we had 200 people meet in December. In February, they reconvened. They, they tendered, you know, I think, close to 30 uh, idea applications. And then beyond that, then those groups got together. And there were a number of theme areas. One is water management, because a lot of the way we, we look at water management and, and uh, we do that is based on space-related technologies. And when I say space-related technologies, that's anywhere from an inch off the ground all the way into deep space. That's, that's the broad definition. Uh, there was a, a theme area around uh, UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. So there's the technological part of it, there's what they can do for us, but then there are huge social and policy issues that we have to grapple with. Um, there are other issues <coughs> around the educational opportunities that would accrue from such a challenge. Um, and then uh, it's, it's not closed yet, so we're, this is not a one-shot deal. This is going to be something we'll pursue in, in, the next, in the next year or two or three. Uh, the way I, I like to look at it is if you look at how space deployed technologies have really changed our lives in the last 10 or 20 years. I mean, 20 years ago, the flip phone was really cool, right? I'm, I'm thinking of going back to one, actually. But uh, now our, I think our cell phones has more computing power than you know, the Apollo spacecrafts used to have on them. Um, and the way people interact with each other, the way they communicate with each other, I alluded to it earlier, the way young people communicate, the way my kids communicate, they're in their 20s and they don't talk to each other, they text each other. Um, but it really changes the way we interact socially. So I think there's huge opportunities for the social scientists to study the amazing transformation that'll occur in how we communicate in the next 10 years. Uh, commercialization of the space is just taking off now. And once that happens, we'll be deploying more communication and information satellites. Oh, there'll be a tsunami of information coming back to Earth. So I think the challenges of space, most of them are going to be here on Earth, and I think we're the perfect university to say, how are we going to make our lives better, uh, and how do we uh, more optimally engage these space-deployed technologies? So um, there's a, a Grand Challenge Steering Committee, uh, and if any faculty have ideas, I would encourage them to contact Dean Lee or Walid Abdullahi, who are co-chairing the committee, or Diane Demeff or Kay Orton, who are helping staff it. And we want to bring the best ideas to the table. And um, I just want to just reiterate that this will be a, the grand challenge will be defined by our faculty. You certainly don't want a provost to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of switching topics uh, on a topic that everyone talks about, faculty, staff, and students, and that's tuition and, and budgets. And so I just kind of want to get an idea of <laughs> The, uh, <laughs> want to get an idea of the future funding for this university. So I'm, I think I'm going to yield that to you, Kelly. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so I uh, want to extend my appreciation to the board. They uh, approved uh, tuition rates uh, actually on Monday. And uh, so that's great because we are now positioned to really tell our students next year what they can expect um, financially. You may have read in the paper that Tuition uh, for resident undergraduates will be going up 2.9%, and um, for non-residents, 3%. And the, the state picture we are pleased for fiscal year 2016 looks positive, and we are still hopeful that there'll be um, about a 10% increase. Um, I'm cautious when I say that because I don't want us to get too excited. Uh, we are still not back to the levels that we were at before we started being cut. You know, this will bring us to about 69 million. We were at 83 million before all those cuts were taken. But that's good news, and we're appreciative. 
Um, I also would just remind you that uh, every spring I hold some coffee and budget sessions and uh, would invite you to come and learn more about the budget and, and all that's going on. When, when are they? When? So they'll be uh, late April, and I don't have those dates off the top of my head, but we'll, we'll get those posted and maybe put an article in CU Boulder today to, to make sure everybody knows about them. Great. So as those revenues come in, what do you see as the investment priorities for the campus, Kelly? Sure. We uh, put together a strategic budget process a couple of years ago, uh, Russ and I did, and that really has brought all of leadership together to help identify what the priorities for investing are. That culminated in... Um, a retreat that we had in January, and the retreat identified uh, quite a few priorities for the campus. The first priorities for fiscal year 16 include uh, investing in faculty and staff salaries, so a compensation pool of 3%, and again, appreciate that the board approved that on Monday as well. Uh, other investments include um, around our uh, enrollment initiatives and the retention strategies. We also are investing in deferred maintenance. Many of you know that we have very aging facilities and we need to start having a very strategic approach to how we get on top of those issues. And then finally, I'm, I'm pleased that we've been able to work together to develop uh, a new enrollment model, which will help uh, the units understand that as enrollment increases, that there are funds that will follow the enrollment model and there'll be funds there to support um, that growth in enrollment. Yeah, that's just with, a few of them. And with, if I may, sure. and with respect to some of the investments we're making on campus, uh, any investment that we do make on campus, realizing that we're not awash in spare funds, far from that far, that's far from the case. But uh, there are three priorities that go into making any decision that we make to invest. That's reputation, and uh, particularly reputation as a great national research university. And I've given you all statistics on that before, so I'll spare you this time. But that's paramount. Uh, that's of paramount importance. Our reputation as a national research university and as, and as an innovative university moving forward. Another key priority uh, given to us by the chancellor is we are very focused on promoting student success. And then the other uh, priority is alternate revenue sources. And in my office, I construe that to mean development of new innovative programs that distinguish us from our peers. So uh, you have to hit at least two of those if we're going to invest in it. And hopefully, you hit all three of them. And uh, I think that helps us define who we are, and I think those three uh, priorities are actually touchstones for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah. and I'm really, and we're changing the complexion of how we make our decisions. The deans and the vice chancellors are integrally involved, so I, I think we're, I, I'm excited Good. about it, actually. Good. So continuing on that topic of funding, Phil, I have a question for you. Um, Colorado is already ranked as one of the very lowest states when it comes to support of higher education. We're number one. <laughs> <laughs> the lowest so, funding. <laughs> that's a great place to be, right. What is the future of state funding, and why do you think higher ed is a good investment for the state of Colorado? Sure. I, I mean, first of all, I, I want to echo what, what Kelly said, and, and to really thank the, uh, the governor and the legislature for the support this year. Uh, to get uh, a 10% increase, um, and we hope we get that um, by the end of the session, uh, is, uh, I think shows the commitment on the part of the state. However, I think as we all know, um, that if there aren't some policy changes uh, in the next few years, that Colorado could become the first state in the country to go to zero funding for higher education. Uh, and certainly, I think the University of Colorado Boulder could be the first uh, institution of higher ed in the state to go to zero funding. And, and, the, and the reason I mention that is, is that we have other ways of increasing revenue, of uh, bringing in revenue that uh, some of our uh, other campuses uh, around the state don't, you know, especially with our non-resident population and also uh, with our international students and our entrepreneurship and our, the innovation that you know, the faculty keep coming up with. But, but we have to take a look at, at that state funding. And, and I didn't want to just sit on my hands and say, let's wait and see what the state does. Let's see if the state uh, and the citizens repeal TABE or, or do something differently or add a tax or whatever. Let's really, let's, let's be innovative. Let's be entrepreneurial. Let's be aggressive. And let's look at ways of increasing revenue to offset any of the loss of revenue from the state. Uh, and I think we've been, we've been doing well in that front. Uh, I, I, I talked to Kelly and Russ about, you know, let's try to ra raise what, $10 million mm -hmm. this year, additionally, not counting tuition uh, and state money, 
And we're going to be able to do that. And we're going to be able to do that through uh, private fundraising. I mean, last year, private fundraising for the Boulder campus was roughly $120 million in private fundraising. That's double what the state puts in. Uh, so already we're looking at, you know, how do we shift from state funding to private funding. But also, uh, we're doing more with industry research. Uh, we open up our Office of Indus Industry Research that Caroline Himes is heading. And our goal is to move from about $20 million to $100 million. So we have to look at ways of generating more revenue. And that's why, as Russ mentioned, is it's one of our goals, the alternative sources of revenue. At the same time, we have to look at, uh, again, the role of a research university like ours. It's an e economic engine for the state. We provide enormous revenue for the state of Colorado and also for our local, for the city of Boulder and for the county. When you think of our research funding, uh, expenditures of about $300 million a year, uh, when we look at startup companies, um, we've had roughly 80-some startup comp companies in the last uh, 10 years. Many of them are still going strong, uh, and they're helping the state economy. And I believe that the legislature, uh, the legislators, the governor, and certainly our board uh, understand the, the importance of the economic engine that we bring uh, to the state as a university. Not just the Boulder campus, but the entire system. And so we have to keep getting that message out, that uh, we're providing a great deal of revenue when you look at um, our our budget, our salaries make up what? How many millions? Oh, I don't know. Off the top of my head, three hundred seventy. Yeah, four hundred million dollars, yeah, yeah, roughly. So, yeah. You should know that. I know I should. <laughs> You're the CFO. Come on. <laughs> but no, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, it's, a, yeah, it's like four hundred sixty million dollars yeah. or something in that neighborhood. Um, so anyhow, it's it's very important from the standpoint of economic development. Um, but we do realize the state's in a very very difficult position. And uh, we still want to count on state aid. There's no doubt about it. But we can't just sit around waiting for something to happen. You know, I wonder, um, we're a chatty group. <laughs> and uh, I think maybe we might want to jump to some of the email questions, because I, I think we're uh, running a little late on time. Would that make sense for us to maybe? Do we? OK. Oh, OK, we do. I'm All right. Getting a sign. OK, I've got a good one. <laughs> there was probably going to be a hard question for Kelly, and she just wanted to. <laughs> you know, I was thinking we should skip <laughs> those oh, right. questions. Oh, oh, yeah, let's right. go to those okay. email questions. Okay. <laughs> so, I like that. No, I've got a good one. Faculty oh, love to okay. talk about this one. Um, just yesterday in the Daily Camera, there were several pictures of the um, athletic facility expansion. Ah, yes. And um, faculty <laughs> love to. Let's go to those email questions. Yeah, those <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Faculty love to sit around and gripe about uh, how much we invest in athletics and that we invest too much in athletics and not enough in academics here at CU Boulder. So, Phil, what do you say to that? Oh, me. Oh, you. Yeah, students. <laughs> students like to talk about this, too. Russell. Well, we have our AD in the back, Rick George. And, and uh, actually, I, I want to begin on, uh, and, and thank Rick. Uh, Rick has been a terrific uh, athletic director. He hasn't been here for even two years. and. So much has gotten accomplished uh, under Rick's leadership. And when you think about the new facilities, um, the new facilities are being paid for not by uh, tuition dollars, but by um, private funding, by sponsorships, uh, by partnerships, uh, for example, with uh, Boulder Community uh, Health and also uh, our Anschutz Medical Center, the University Hospital, uh, UPI. Uh, they're going to be sharing uh, space in the new facility. And so that facility of, you know, we've already raised um, roughly $70 million, between 70 and $75 million. And Rick has his um, initiative called the Drive for 105. Uh, and the Drive for 105 is, is to uh, raise another $85 million for the facilities, uh, to complete the facilities. Again, all private funding uh, and sponsorships, plus another $20 million uh, for endowments for our student athletes. And, and I, I really am, am proud of that because uh, endowments are necessary for the future of this university, uh, for everything, for scholarships, for, uh, for faculty chairs, and so on, but also for our student athletes. So Rick and his team uh, have done a great job of raising uh, private money through sponsorships uh, and partnerships uh, to pay for those facilities. Also, when you think about it, and we sometimes haven't talked about it, um, but we probably have spent uh, in the last um, 10 years, probably over 
$800 million, it's about $850, $860 million on new academic and non-academic facilities on the campus, not counting athletics. I mean, when you think about uh, our new biotechnology building, uh, the Carruthers Building on the East Campus, we're completing the new SEEK building uh, on the East Campus. Uh, for our students, the Center for Community, which is a marvelous uh, building. Uh, and then we've upgraded our residence halls. Uh, we've taken one off, uh, a residence hall offline each year for a number of years and remodeled uh, those residence halls. So we've invested quite a bit of money. And again, that's come from, um, from our auxiliaries like uh, dining and uh, parking, dining and housing and dining and parking. Uh, it's come from private funding. Uh, we have some money from the state. So when you look at it, and renovation of Ketchum, uh, which the state funded this past year. So when you look at what we've done probably over the last five to 10 years, we've invested about $850, $860 million. And we don't talk about that that much, and we should. Uh, because if you walk around this campus, you'll notice the beautiful new buildings, uh, the upgraded residence halls, and what we're doing with buildings such as as Ketchum and what we'll be doing uh, with engineering and Carlson uh, in the near future. We've added, um, I want to say, about 2 million square feet, sonable square feet, just in the last um, five to eight years on the campus. And so uh, I'm very, um, I, I understand when faculty say, you know, we need, you know, better offices and we need to upgrade and so on. Uh, and we need to do that. Um, but we also need, I believe, if we're going to be uh, in intercollegiate athletics, if we're going to be a, a member of the Pac-12, uh, I want to be as competitive in intercollegiate athletics as I am as competitive in our research and in our teaching. Uh, that's the way I think we're successful. And so um, I think Rick and his team um, have done a great job. And, um, and I believe, and, and we have stories, and I can give you a couple, we've had athletic donors who have no connection to the university. They're not alums or parents, uh, but they enjoy sports. And they give money to athletics. But as they're giving money to athletics, they find out about our music program. And there's a, a couple who um, found out about the Thompson Jazz, uh, jazz Program uh, and wanted to give money to the, the jazz program after giving to athletics. And then became a mentor in our college of business, in our school of business. Uh, and so we do have these individuals who start off with uh, a donation to athletics because of their um, love of sports or whatever. But then they migrate over to the academic house as well. So uh, I'm pleased with where we are um, with, with athletics and, and the leadership of uh, Rick George and where we're headed. Uh, but we're not, we're not doing it instead of what buildings for uh, academic and non-academic um, for our students. So Russ, what would you say the, uh, the university's academic commitment <coughs> is to our student athletes? Uh, it, it's very strong. So uh, for the last four or five years, every year the uh, GPAs of our student athletes is every semester they break a record. I think the average GPAs of our student athletes now uh, mirror the average GPA of our student body. Um, I think the nice thing about uh, the way we've set up academic support for our student athletes is the academic advising uh, portion of the athletics department reports to me as opposed to the uh, athletic department. Uh, Chris Livingston runs, runs a wonderful shop to provide support for our student athletes. Uh, and um, I think we've seen success stories all along. So I think student is really underlined in the term student athlete through these programs. And I think a lot of the credit goes to Bill's leadership uh, because years ago he decided to really make that commitment and change the reporting line of student student athlete academic support, uh, and we work in great partnership with that with the athletic department uh, on, in that regard. Awesome. So now we're going to transition into emailed questions that we had received, and uh, these are questions again from faculty, students, and staff, and we tried to consolidate most of these questions. Um, but some questions that uh, some questions that will not be addressed will will not be addressed here will be addressed with uh, individual department managers and they will be able to answer those. So Sharon, would you get us started? Sure. Why don't we take a couple of these and then let's head out into the crowd? <coughs> what do you say? Okay. All right. 
So here's one that is especially relevant to me as a mother of two. Um, here's a question. Why was the tuition benefit for faculty and staff dependents changed from nine credit hours to a 10% discount? And isn't this actually a reduction in the benefit? Kelly. <laughs> Uh, well, this change was actually made uh, at the request of staff council and the faculty assembly. Uh, there was really a concern that our historic benefit uh, was only available on a space available basis. And so what that meant was that if you had a dependent that uh, was interested in enrolling here, they would not be able to really participate in the benefit and graduate on time because they would have to wait until the first day of class. So. Um, we transfer, transform the benefit to become uh, available to register when registration opens. And so as a student wants to be on track to graduate on time, they can uh, register for that course um, in the timely way that all others can. With making that change, though, that meant that we no longer knew which seat uh, caused us to move into needing another section and, and, and all of that. And so it became a, an expense item. And 10% uh, is where we started and pegged it so that we could evaluate what the um, uptake was. And we've set a goal of trying to get to 30% over time. And 30% would be the equivalent of a nine credit hour benefit. And um, we're going to look at uh, first year's data this summer to see how it was done. And hopefully when my kids go to college in 10 years, it'll be higher than that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, that, that is our goal. <laughs> and we also got a few questions about uh, questions about instructors. Um, so are, are instructors being paid fairly as tuition rises? Russ, you want to take that one? Sure. So uh, yes, I, I believe they are. So if we look at uh, for instructors who are 50% time or more, uh, that means they all get full benefits. And if we benchmark them against instructors at comparable institutions, they're getting a, a competitive salary and, and a quite good salary. Some years ago, there was an instructor bill of rights that passed with, in, in an attempt to actually normalize that. Our instructors also, as of the last few years, have been given the opportunity to have multi-year contracts that didn't used to be allowable uh, on, on, on campus, but then there was a change uh, in the legislature that allowed us to do that. So uh, unlike many places where contingent faculty are year to year or even semester to semester, um, we, many of our uh, instructor rank faculty, again, 50% or more, uh, are career um, uh, faculty. Uh, they're members of our faculty, and in many respects, they're, they have voting privileges in certain areas. And uh, they're a very, very valued member of our faculty contingent here on campus. And uh, we're very supportive of them. Great. And we also got questions about bicycle racks, um, especially covered bicycle racks. <laughs> you know, we all love to bike. Um, so I guess this would be a question for Kelly. <laughs> Are right. you? Maybe we shouldn't have gone to the. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be adding any more covered bicycle racks uh, in the near future? Sure. You know, bicycling is an important part of our uh, culture, and we have about 22% of our students that actually use bicycles to get around. Um, and uh, we have 13,000 bike racks, so we have lots of spaces for bike racks already. Uh, we do have covered bike racks in several locations, and as we look at renovated renovation projects, we will be continuing to look at what additional um, spaces can we make available. So I don't have an immediate plan to roll out for you today, but I can tell you that it's always on our radar. So how about one more email question, and then we'll head out to the audience. This one's for you, Phil. Um, we've talked about dwindling state support for the university. Is becoming a private university an option? Not really. Uh, I get asked that question quite a bit about, you know, if we're only getting 5% of our budget from the state, why don't we just become a private uh, institution? I mean, number one, we're a state institution in the Constitution. So it would actually take a vote of the citizens to move us from a public to a private. But I think more importantly than that uh, is, you know, the reason that, that I got into higher education at a public university, and I think, you know, Russ and Kelly and the faculty and others as well, we believe in public higher education, and we believe in the public good, uh, and we believe in you know, the importance of educating uh, citizens of Colorado. Uh, and so uh, I, I don't want to become a private university. Uh, I, you know, I definitely want to become, stay a private, uh, public university uh, that may have very little or any state funding, but we can't lose that mission of a public university preparing the citizens of Colorado uh, and preparing our young people to become citizens, uh, productive citizens in the state. Yeah, and I, and I think it's part and parcel of that, 
<coughs> is it, it's very important for us to maintain that public mission and try to maintain accessibility and affordability. Uh, and so if I look at it, I just want to take the opportunity to really acknowledge the faculty and the staff. We have, if you look at how much we invest in, 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 in this university, we're not charging Stanford tuition levels, and yet the, the level of support we get from the state is quite low. Yet uh, by every objective metric, we have uh, absolutely one of the most productive staffs and faculties in the, in the nation uh, by any metric. And for that, we're very proud. And uh, I think the idea that we're going back the other direction is I don't think we should fool ourselves to think that's the case. And in fact, we're becoming a national model amongst other publics. They're now looking at us to say, how, how can we be more like Colorado? Look, these guys are you know, top 10, arguably, as a, in productivity as a national research university. Uh, how do they do it? We're not telling them. <laughs> great. Well, these have been some great questions and answers. And um, Judon and I are going to head down into the audience. Because this involves audience participation, I want to just warm you up briefly with a knock-knock joke. You all know about knock-knock jokes, right? OK. Knock-knock. Yeah. Interrupting cow. <laughs> Moo. Okay, my five-year-old loves that joke. But. Okay, so Sharon will be covering that side. I'll be covering this side. So just raise your hand if you have a question, and uh, let's try to keep it concise so we can get to everyone. Don't be shy. Oh, right here. I heard some dialogue about aging facilities, and my experience as a student here from last August I'm also wondering about new facilities and what the lowest bid process looks like and what the accountability for those contracts looks like. If you could offer a little insight, I'd appreciate it. For new facilities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we have a very rigorous process and it's, um, it's prescribed by both state law and by our own fiscal rules that we have at the institution. And so there is a, a public bid process that we go through where an RFP is issued and uh, we receive solicitations or responses back from that. And those are evaluated both on performance and price. Someone on this side? Um, can you speak a little bit about the Be Colorado Anywhere, and what that entails, and where that's going to take us? Did you hear the question? Be Boulder, I think, is what the... Oh, be Boulder be Anywhere? Be Boulder Anywhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Be Boulder yes. Anywhere. Yeah, so actually, um, there are several facets to this. One is it, it fits in nicely to uh, developing new revenue sources for the university. So we've had a long history of de uh, um, delivering online education through the uh, Office of Continuing Education. Um, and also, we have some very successful distance education programs that existed in the College of Engineering. Um, that coupled with our deployment of professional master's programs, uh, we want to make those available to students on campus. That generates a lot of revenue. And as a, as a great research university, we have faculty who can provide professional master's programs that are in high demand from employers, both uh, locally and regionally. Now, the Be Boulder Anywhere platform allows us to, to deliver these programs at a distance uh, so people don't have to drive all the way to Boulder. Uh, and um, we can use um, synchronous um, distance education, asynchronous dis distance education as part of our financial strategy uh, to develop alternate revenue sources. In addition, I think it's part of a reputational strategy to uh, give uh, local industries and regional industries the, uh, the opportunity to uh, get courses and training from our world-class faculty. And I, and I think the one, one point that Russ uh, made that I'd just like to expand a little bit on is, is this niche area of professional master's degrees. I mean, that's going to be, uh, we, we didn't want to duplicate what others are doing. We didn't want to just have a um, slew of, of courses and programs and certificates. We really wanted to be deliberate about what we offered. And as we looked at the market, uh, the professional masters uh, for those in business and industry and so on, I think it's a niche area that the University of Colorado Boulder could really be known for. And it would help our reputation. It would also fit our student success model. And it certainly would provide that alternative revenue. So we really are you know, focusing on um, a number of professional master's degrees that would go out to business industry 
the rest of the community. Okay, just like a bit. Has a How do I get there? Um, you mentioned two buildings going on the East Campus, the Seek Building and BioFrontiers. Could you ex uh, expand on long-range planning for other academic departments, if any, to go to the East Campus and the implications for the main campus? Yeah, so uh, with respect to the occupants of the Seek Building, um, that's the sustainability, sustainability, energy, and environment complex. So units that are involved in those theme areas are already moving, scheduled to move out to that area. Uh, this actually speaks to um, a space study that's going on on campus as well. So as units move to the east, and you see all that building going on to the east, there's a, there's a little shift in the center of gravity of campus to the east, and that'll vacate space on the main campus. And what we want to do is take the opportunity uh, to be very strategic in how we utilize that space. And um, I mean, in a perfect world, we said if we would say, if we were starting today, where would we want everybody to be located? So we're hoping to, after we get our uh, current space study completed, uh, to engage in those kinds of discussions on campus. I think I would also add that there is a planned aerospace building that's for the um, East Campus that has been on the list for four or five years now, right? Right. Yeah. right. Why would they ask that? Um, so I'm Rob Davis, the Dean of Engineering. In terms of academic departments, chemical and biological engineering is already in the biotechnology building along with the BioFrontiers Institute. Biochemistry is there as well, which is half of chemistry and biochemistry. And then in SEEK, I think there's some full academic departments like ATOC going there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, environmental engineering is going there, which is part of a department. As Kelly mentioned, there'll be a full aerospace engineering sciences uh, department on East Campus, we expect, in the near future. So. There's probably going to be four or five departments over there within a few years, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a dozen within 10 years. Yeah, and I think the important feature of that, too, is they're not going as silos or enclaves. They're going and they're interacting with other people from other disciplines and other departments, and I think that's going to be really exciting. And um, So environmental studies is headed out that way. Any other questions? Students, any students have any questions? <laughs> okay, I'll right. give it five more seconds. Yes, here we go. Um, I think that everyone can pretty much agree that when it comes to student success, that one of the most important things is that they have professors that they're really engaging with. And I wanted to hear what you guys think a little bit about and just about the process of hiring teachers um, to understand how it is more than just the resume, how you're trying to attempt that you get the best, um, best teachers, best, best explaining and connecting with students as possible. And maybe also as a slightly separate question, I know it's really difficult at a giant university, of course, not to have a lot of huge classes, but is there any move to try to make, to hire more teachers and have smaller class sizes? Yeah, absolutely. So with respect to the process of hiring uh, professors who have a responsibility to conduct research, but they also have a responsibility to be very, very good in the classroom. Um, I think on average, from, you know, I, I'm pulling a number out of the year, but I know it's in the right ballpark for every tenure track faculty member we hire, we get almost 100 applications. So uh, it's a very rigorous process and included in the, in the vetting process is we look, certainly we look at their research and scholarly re resume. We also look at their resume with regard to uh, how they're going to perform not only in the classroom but uh, how they're going to perform with respect to, del to delivering graduate ed education and experiential education. I can also tell you that uh, through our tenure track reappointment and tenure review processes, uh, that the teaching records are taken very, very seriously. And um, being a, a member, I have a vice chancellor's, vice chancellor's advisory committee, and, and I can tell you they, they're very, very rigorous with respect to how they uh, vet the teaching resume of our faculty. With respect to instructors, as I said, um, we handle our instructors, I think, quite differently from many institutions that I'm familiar with. Uh, they're part of our faculty, and they're actually career uh, a rank faculty. With respect to huge classes, and, and I see I'm looking at someone right now who's probably better qualified to answer this question, 
but we're national leaders in STEM education, and we have a, a, a program that I think was founded here called the Learning Assistant Model. Uh, and that involves, um, I, I won't try to explain the whole thing because I'll probably butcher it, but it, it involves the use of learning undergraduate learning assistants who were very successful in that class before, and they conduct uh, discussion sections. So while, while you might have a large uh, lecture class being delivered uh, by a, a faculty member of record, you have uh, a lot of breakout groups and recitation groups uh, that are mentored by uh, learning assistants and teaching assistants. And that's been shown statistically to be much better with respect to learning outcomes. So we're now we're working on a number of projects with the, the School of Education on deploying that, that program at scale, not only through the sciences, but we're beginning to conduct uh, research and exper uh, experiments in the social sciences to see if that same model, to see if that same model, model is uh, going to be effective. We have no reason to think that it won't be, but every decision we make has to be based on data and uh, objective information. So before we wrap up, I'd just like to thank you all again for coming today and to let you know that because this is a new format, the Chancellor's Office is interested in your feedback. There will be a survey going out in CU Boulder today um, that where you can provide your feedback on this session. And um, Judon, do you have any final comments? No, yeah, I would just like to say thank you all again for, uh, for being here. And uh, thank you all for allowing me to be one of the moderators with Sharon at this event. And it's awesome. I think this is a lot more interactive and a lot more engaging. Uh, I heard some laughter out there. So <laughs> I think, uh, so I'm really, really pleased with how this turned out. And I'm excited to, I'm excited to continue this in years to come. Uh, Phil, would you like to close this out? Sure, just, uh, just briefly, uh, again, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I think one of the things that I wanted to accomplish with this format is for the faculty and the staff and our students to see how we work together as a team. Uh, you know, usually I do uh, my state of the campus, as Sharon mentioned, in the fall where I'm up, you know, kind of giving a lecture. Uh, but, but the success of this campus is really taken when, when you have the cabinet members and not all the vice chancellors are up here, but, but certainly Kelly is, as our CFO and Russ as um, our provost and executive vice chancellor, that it's, it's really a team approach of how we, um, how we work together uh, to improve the campus, to get your ideas, especially from the deans, from the faculty, from the staff and students, and move those ideas forward. So uh, again, I want to thank you all for being here. We, are, we do have a reception uh, afterwards, if you can stay. Uh, the three of us will be uh, around to answer questions, along with other vice chancellors uh, and the deans who are here. So again, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate it, and uh, go Buffs. <laughs>